live stream. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have a very special guest, uh, one of the best dudes I know, one of the most oh. prolific bass players I know, uh, Mr. Frank Bello. Good Hello, afternoon, everybody. Frank. How are you? Hi, Eric. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm, um, I'm feeling the after effect of my first night out with a dinner that turned into a, uh, a more of a liquid dinner. Hmm. You can tell by my eyes right now. <laughs> um, I didn't realize where, where it was going, but it went there. And I got home. I didn't even get home late. It's like, you know, I'm a lightweight, dude. I'm, I'm a complete lightweight. But uh, <laughs> So if I'm a little slower today, I apologize in advance. No problem at all. Duly noted. Uh, that actually, you know, it's a good way to kick this off because obviously this past year and a half have been uh, insane and nobody could have imagined. So, you know, as things are starting to get back, you know, it's 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 a nice feeling to be able to go out and do these things and, you know, live music's coming back and all that. How did, how did you stay busy and creative during this whole craziness? Good question. First, um, you're looking at it right here. You see this this room I'm in? It's, it's my, my basement. Uh, like everybody else in the world right now, they're going to a, a spot in their home that they can just have a corner of it. Like my wife and my son are upstairs and they have their life. He goes to school upstairs on the computer. And my wife is at her job in the computer, right? This has been my life for the last year and a half, trying to create, trying to work. You know, I've done a lot of jams here via, via Zoom and stuff. And um, just it's, it, it, it's, it's different. I, look, I'm a homebody anyway. I've traveled all my life it was nice to be home for a while but this is ridiculous you know at yeah. this point but you know i just tried to keep busy and write i got pretty creative um with writing music and um and the book <laughs> so it it's been a it's been a, a good creative time but i'm um i'm yearning to get out on the on the stage again and just to be in front of an audience yeah i can imagine can, can you tell us more about the book that you got going on yeah well uh, it's called Fathers, Brothers, and Sons. Uh, it's written by me, myself, and uh, my co-writer, Joe McIver. Uh, it's the, um, written of a lot of, just look him up. He's done a lot of books with a lot of great people. Uh, he, helped me, um, he helped me get a lot of the inner depths of my mind out uh, and the scrapbook of my life on, onto paper, which I'm pretty excited about. It's, uh, it talks about, I'll be really honest with this, man. It talks about uh, my life and abandonment, uh, what people, a lot of people don't know is that, um, like a lot of people, I was abandoned. When I was 10 years old, my dad took off uh, from a family of five. So leaving my mom and five kids, and I was the oldest, uh, to fend for themselves pretty much. And um, I, we don't know why, blah, 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 that whole story. But a lot of hardships, um, poverty, going through that stuff. Um, and along the way, um, is unfortunately, the, at 23 years old, my brother Anthony was murdered in Bronx, New York. Uh, we talk about that and how how we're still dealing with that. To, to be honest, after a lot of therapy and 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 it's really it's just really cathartic for me to talk about this stuff. A lot of there's a lot of great things in this book, like like great um, rock and roll stories, right? Uh, that I've had in my life. There's two sides of it. That's this book. It's it's really the the emotional stuff. That's my life, and uh, the rock and roll stories. That is my other life in Anthrax. So. It's it's a lot for everybody. I think this is this is something for everybody. And the bottom line is, I would you know, as I'm trying to tell people at this age, uh, this is cathartic for me. And I'm I'm just trying to say, look, if I can do this and brush myself off, and come back and 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 do something, try to do something positive in my life, that's what I'm trying to convey to people right now. I think it's important because there's a lot of pain out there, especially now, especially now. Um, I I'm pro people, you know. Um, I, I grew up in a house full of strong women and there were strong women in my life to, uh, to, to take that role and, and make me, uh, and make me the, the man I am along with some great, um, uh, father figures I've had. And it's all in the book. And I, I, it's really just like, you can do this, man. You know, it's been, a, it's been a good ride and don't give up and all that good stuff because, uh, there's, there's another day ahead of you. That's great, man. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. I mean, it obviously it takes a lot of courage to write, to, to undertake a project like that. Thank and, you. um, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure a lot of people uh, people are as well. Uh, so that kind of leads us, you know, let's go back to the beginning in terms of mm. the music stuff. You know, it's kind of a, I'm sure you've been asked this a hundred times type of question, but how did, how did it all start in terms of you playing music and, and why bass? Well, funny enough, you know, I grew up, uh, as a lot of people know, I'm, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. And after my dad took off, uh, I 
there wasn't a lot of money in my family with my mom. She, you know, we were on welfare, all that, you know, that's all that stuff. So, uh, and plus I went, we had to move out of our house into a, um, a sketchy kind of area where every day I walked to school and I was getting beaten up. And it's, this is all in the book. I was getting beaten up by these two specific guys, two definite, uh, definitive guys. And one bigger guy that is no way I was, a, I was a smaller guy who was just pounding on me every day Go on my way to school. So it was like clockwork. You go there and the only way I can get away is to hide on the cars. I literally hide on the cars after getting the beating every day before school. So I couldn't take that anymore. Uh, I was freaking out. I was bugging out mentally, physically, all of the above. I didn't know if I was going to survive. So uh, my mother was great enough to make the decision to maybe I should go live with my grandmother, uh, which was my oasis and in the back to the Bronx in New York. Um, and I, in that house, uh, Charlie Benanti, who is the drummer of Anthrax, uh, who is actually related to he's my He's actually my uncle by a couple of years. He's my mother's brother. Uh, we, um, we, learned uh, well he started he was a great drummer four years old and he always had music in his life i learned from him i wanted to do what he did so he started playing guitar i then i, I kind of got into it because i was looking at that and i wanted to learn so i started on rhythm guitar and then we would jam together uh and he was the one that noticed that i was playing bass parts on the guitar so rhythm guitar i was literally hearing the bass parts and and just my ear went to that and i was playing the bass parts on, on rhythm guitar. So he's the one and along with my friend Mike jamming and we were saying, they said to me, why don't you just switch to the bass because you're playing the bass parts anyway. And that was it. Once I, once I got the part, once I got that vibe and, and the bass in my hand, um, 13 years old, 14 years old, it all made sense to me. And then from then on, that was the love of my life and uh, just started learning everything I could. Um, and, and it's been, it's been, I still have that love today for the, for the bass. Right. That's, that's awesome. What, what were some of your like driving influences in terms of bass players back then when you were kind of acclimating to the instrument and developing your skill set? Uh, it, it's funny you say that because it's all one for me. Like my father figures, like people I looked up to, my heroes, my heroes were bass players. And because I guess there was no kind of father figure to, for me to, to, to look at and <clears throat> to um, idolize. So my bass players, my heroes were um, Geezer Butler, Steve Harris, and Getty Lee. You know, those are my, you know, from Rush, obviously Geezer from, uh, Geezer from Sabbath, Getty Lee from Rush, and uh, Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. They, um, that's what I wanted to do. I saw that on stage, along with Kiss. I can't forget Kiss. Kiss were big heroes of mine. Uh, that's in the, this is all in the book, um, and how much, how in-depth I was with these guys, because I was pretty obsessed along with my friends. And um, they were like, they were the path for me that I saw that. And I said, this is what I want to do with my life, period. So whatever I had to do in school to get through school. And I did, thankfully, graduated, actually graduated earlier, early to get on tour with Anthrax. That's a whole other story that's in the book. But um, it, it's been a great ride, man. Uh, I, I love the decision I made. I'm very lucky. I know how much luck is involved with this game. So um, it all worked out after all the... Um, all the ug ugliness that can life can bring you. So I, I believe everybody should play an instrument or at least listen to a lot of music for the outlet, the outlet in your life. It's, it, it, it really, it's that release valve for me. When the pressure gets too much and your head wants to blow up, music is the way. And you're a musician, Eric. You know this. It's the it's that release valve where it just takes it all away. Yeah. It makes you get into a different different mind path, right? Totally. That's what it does. <clears throat> so you um. So after that, you know, Anthrax, you mentioned that you, you left, you, well, you graduated early to go on tour. So that, that must have been, obviously, right out of high school, you started hitting the road with Anthrax. Is that correct? 17. I graduated. I, I grew up <clears throat> here in, in the Bronx. And um, I found out that there was, this, there was this program. I saw a lot of my friends graduating earlier. They get, they get their credits. You know, credits are and stuff. So they get credits earlier. And you could double up on your credits by going in, in the morning at 8 o'clock. And you stayed at like 4.30 in the afternoon you just double up you do extra work and um at the time i knew anthrax uh, they auditioned uh bass players long story short i auditioned charlie got me in the audition because i was friends with those guys anyway so uh i got the gig but i wasn't out of school yet uh so the only way i can do this little tour we were doing and it's like a three-week tour of america in a van 
uh, I doubled up my credits. I did that and I graduated early and I was able to do that tour. And it, it all worked pretty nicely. Uh, 17, 18, going on 18 years old that time. Um, so that was my first, and Anthrax is my first band. So it's still, it's crazy. It's like you, you married your first girlfriend. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's weird at a school and it's, it's, it's been, and now it's like, God, it, we're celebrating our 40th year anniversary. So it's a, it's a pretty great, uh, pretty great run. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. And as you should be, I mean, that's pretty wild. It's been that long. That's, that's an achievement for all you guys. Um, what, you know, back then in the, in those years, you know, the whole thrash metal and just metal in general kind of changing in those days, what were some of the challenges that you guys faced because of that? Well, back then, um, this was the, um, uh, bringing up of thrash metal and they put it they put a name on it and people uh fans and stuff and it's all good was it i mean you gotta re realize it was, it was a bunch of there was exodus there was metallica there was slayer and then later it came megadeth this was all a great ride we knew we all had something everybody felt that swell it was a swell of 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 this music that was connecting with people and that that was that was the important part it all got that angst out of our gut you know what I mean? It was it was that time where, man, something's making me feel like this. And I know people are relating because I could see it in their eyes in, in the audiences. So, you knew you knew it was special and you and you believed in it. And as we do now, uh, we knew it was something special and it became a movement, man. It became this big, big deal. We all toured together, all those bands, a lot of and uh, we stayed on the road. We And the only way to do it is to stay on the road and tour because we didn't get radio play. M MTV very rarely blah 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 they did other stuff and um, the only real way to build this to build this momentum um, was to stay on the road and, and get in front of as many people as you could that's what we did that's awesome I mean that, that must have been crazy back then because you know I try to think of my own touring experiences and obviously they're way different especially since you know in those days there was no internet there was no kind of promotion platforms that exist now where you know, it's it's a lot more accessible to people, and I feel like it was just more of a grind back then. You just had to keep playing and keep touring and keep writing. Um, how did you guys like handle those early days and those chaotic, you know, kind of schedules? Well, you got to remember, there's something great about youth. You're resilient. The resiliency of youth is is, is an awesome thing, and uh, I love that we were young and hungry, and the hunger of of getting to that next move or that next step in this process, because you know it was a bunch of steps. Every, every day, every show is another way of, of building momentum. Um, and look, it's, it gets frustrating like everything else, right? Those van tours, uh, at the time, we have band and crew, and the crew consisted of a couple of friends of ours, let's face it. <laughs> and you know, you know van tours. You, every, yeah. you, if you haven't done a van tour, you, know, you should. you, you got to earn your why. stripes, man. Because you really get to know each other. <laughs> yeah. You really, you really bond. That's really your bonding. And you can see who can handle it and who can't handle it. The smells, there's a lot of smells uh, in those vans, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, I'm just, the, just the ball busting. Anthrax is notorious for the ball busting. We're, we're very sarcastic ball busters. And that's, I guess that's the way we get to know you. And if you can hang and not, you know, can hang with us, we don't want to offend anybody, but it's our kind of way of testing people. That's with just New Yorkers that bust balls. Uh, I, I, I cherish those days looking back. Of course, now, believe me, I want a tour bus now and I want my bunk. I want to sleep. I don't want to sleep like this in, a, in the back of a van <laughs> crowded by everybody else. But um, it was kind of, I, I kind of want to move on from those days. But it was a great learning experience. And for any young band, for me, please do that. And I understand it's tough, but that's the only way to get in front of people now. That's right now. That's, and and put, your, put your music out there. Yeah, that actually, we're going to take some some user questions here in a second. Um, but right. that, that what you just said kind of made me think of something else, which is another kind of, you've probably been asked this a bunch of times, but, you know, you mentioned, you know, younger bad just getting out there and playing. You know, it, is there any other advice you give people in this day and age that are trying to get started in music, whether it's their own individual or bands? Like, what do you think are the key things now that people should or need to be doing? Well, first off, and... I don't want to mean that to sound like the old pro, uh, the old pro, but I just want to help people understand. Um, believe in what you're doing. Believe. Don't be a don't be a follower. Create what you want from the from the gut, from the from the gut and the heart. Really, that's that's what's really important because that's the only thing that's going to make you believe in those tough times. Why it's worthwhile. You have to you have to follow through like we we did in the early days because we knew 
this wasn't the music that was out there, but we, we believe that if enough people heard it, they would get it as we did. So if you believe in what you do, that's, that's first of all, you have to believe in that. And uh, the next part of it is you really use technology the way you, we didn't have that. We did, Eric, you remember this, cassette tapes, man. <laughs> cassette, it was all, we were handing cassettes and stuff like that. We were tape trading. That, that was a big deal. That was before internet and all that stuff. They yeah. have this wonderful internet thing now that could be your enemy or friend. Use it as your friend and, and utilize it and get as much, as, as much play on it as you can, your music, and that, that's important. You know, it's so, there's so many great things out there. Even YouTube is awesome. So um, I, I just, you have to stick with it. You can't just be half-hearted into it. You gotta go all in uh, and, and do it now. I, I don't, I, my thing is never say I should have. I always say that to myself. Even back in the day, I said, I never, I never wanna say in my lifetime that I should have done this. I want to do it now and go for it. And that's that's just the way I live. I think that's really good advice. I mean, I think that, um, you know, this past year, I think a lot of creative people have been, you know, as we already discussed, kind of been sequestered in their home. And obviously a lot of new podcasts got started. A lot of new music projects get started. Um, actually, Jim wants to know if you guys, Anthrax, did any long distance recording or, or writing sessions, you know, virtually during all this. You know, it's funny, we all exchange. The hardest thing to do, and we found this out the hard way, is to do what we're doing now and trying to jam. The latency mm. on the drums to the guitars makes it almost a half, a half a second, two seconds later or, or earlier. You can't get that exact vibe. You know when you just write, you're writing and you're just jamming? It's so frustrating. So what we're still doing is, we're set, we're, now we're sending, we used to send tapes, but now we just send files to each other. Um, and that really works, but we, we're, we get together now, uh, nobody wants to get on a plane for a while, but now we're, we're, we're going to go, I, I have an, I have an appointment. <laughs> we have a, we have a session and we, we do because Charlie's in Chicago, Scott's in LA, I'm in New York, right? So we do a little bit in each town to make everybody, cause everybody has families and stuff. So we'll make it convenient for each guy, whatever is easier at the time, whatever works. So I'll go out. I think my next thing, I think I go to LA first to write with, um, with those guys. We'll all meet in LA and then, uh, Chicago, Charlie lives in Chicago. We'll do some of that. And then those guys will come to New York also. So we, we split it up and believe me, it's, it's not as, it's a pain in the ass to travel. It really is, but there's nothing like getting in front of band members and jamming and getting that vibe it does for, for us it doesn't work unless we, we we're in the room together like we could put as many demos out as as we want you know with each other and, and send each other but we have to get in the room and figure and pound the song out really that's what happens you can get a bunch of great ideas on, on tape and, and files but it doesn't really become the song until we're actually together and pulling stuff out throwing stuff in that's the way it really works yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I feel like, especially with a band like yours, the, the energy is, is is vital, and you can only get that by being together and having that energy uh, yeah. amongst each I mean, other. You, gotta, you look at each other, and that, that feeling when you know, you know you're know you nodding your head, not only headbang, you just know in your head, man, this is if this, if I'm feeling this right here and I'm feeling that vibe, then I know we're onto something good, and, and I think we all feel like that. Yeah. What's up? So obviously you guys are still enjoying the writing process, regardless of how it may have changed uh, throughout the years. Uh, this is going to be uh, maybe a hard question for you, Frank, mm -hmm. but what is your favorite bass line from any Anthrax song? What's the one that Ooh. sticks out to you that is the one that you just love? Would I enjoy playing this stuff like, um, it's a song of the second record. Uh, it's called Lone Justice. Um, it's there's a lot of you can hear all my my influences. Sorry about my dog barking in the backyard right now. If you can hear that, I apologize. I mean, it's COVID time. Um, yeah, my uh, my my favorite to play because it's it's most challenging. You can hear all my influences. You can in, in, my influences in that one. You can hear Steve Harris. You can hear Giza Butler, and you can hear a little bit of Getty Lee in there. So um, yeah, so um, I, the second record of Anthrax. It's called Lone Justice. It's uh, it's one of my favorites. And also, Got the Time is still one of my favorites just because it's fun. It's just fun and it's easy. For, you know what I mean? People can learn that bass line pretty easily and it's just fun to jam along. I'm a, it's a cover. It's a cover song from, uh, from Joe Jackson. So uh, I've always been a fan of that song. So I, I still love playing, and playing that song and seeing the reaction it gets from the crowd. It's a lot of fun. 
So is is there any is there any technically challenging challenging baseline that maybe is not as enjoyable to play live because it's you know a little extra difficult? That is a good question. Um, there's a song. Uh, look, you can look this up in Apple Music, whatever you want. Um, it's called "The Devil You Know." Anthrax. This song, it's not bass. Cha- well, there's some bass stuff, bass runs in there that's a bit challenging. But the thing is, when we do it live, there's this whole. I'm singing the whole chorus with Joey, with my singer Joey Belladonna. And the bass lines are running as we're doing it. And some of them are counter, counter the vocals, you know? And I, I find that because we just had to, re, we had to relearn it because we're doing the, the 40th anniversary thing, the stream, the live stream. I had to relearn it. And we hadn't played it in a while. And to relearn it, yeah, fine. I knew the bass stuff pretty well. But then to coordinate it, here's the trick. To coordinate it, the vocals coming back in, you have to really break it down again. It's like, all right, I do this here and I'm singing this thing here. And that was that was pretty... It was a fun challenge, but um, it that is a definite challenge for me. And uh, I, I, now I got now I have it down. But it took me a couple of listens to get that down again. That's really cool. I mean, now that that's out in the open, so everybody will know. If you guys ever play that again, they're gonna be extra, yeah. extra and attentive you, to you. <laughs> and you can watch me screw it up. It's great. <laughs> nah, you won't screw it up. <laughs> so you know, I'll actually take a, a viewer question that that's that's related. Um, this is from Patrick. He says he's a big fan of you and you're playing big influence on and especially your tone. You. Uh, so you. he's asking, was it your attack on the strings or your amp pedal setup or a combination? Like what what ultimately helped you achieve your tone? Well, like everybody else, bass players, guitar players, drummers, singers, uh, it's a personal thing, right? With tone. You have it in your head what you want to hear. You know exactly when it's right. Um, I have a Sans amp, this little Sans amp pedal, right? That I've, I, I've used forever, that I love. I still have the original one I have. It's still, I've had. And it, it's just, it's the one, I have backups, but this is the, my baby. It works. It's my, I get my initial tone out of that. But I believe every player, Every bass player plays with their either a pick or their fingers. It's in them. It's their tone is in their fingers. Whether you play with the pick, it's the, the aggression you th- you use, uh, the attack you use. I believe those are both really. It comes from you. So um, when you, when I want to dig in a little more and I want a specific tone, I'll dig in a little more. Or I want to pull back, I'll lighten up. I'll go the one finger thing. Like I call this the Getty Lee thing because if you watch that amazing bass player that Getty Lee is. That guy does more with one finger, his forefinger, than a lot of bass players do with their, all their fingers. It's just a lot of fun, and he just he straightens it all out, and he, he just it's really calm, but it sounds incredible. That's what he does. Again, these are all my heroes, but uh, yeah. So the, as far as the tone go, uh, tone goes, and and the playing, it's all within the person. It's you know what you want, you know what you want in your head. Just go for that tone until you get it right. I mean, I've worked on that for a long time. Through the producers and everything else, Eddie Kramer, I remember on, on Among the Living, we took quite a long time um, to go in depth to get the, the right frequencies to get between Charlie Benanti's drums, his kick drums, and Scott Ian's guitars. And I had to come, I didn't have to go on the bottom, I had to go right in the middle with a frequency that really made sense. And, and so we could hear it and it could be one of the instruments. So uh, it takes some time, but it's everybody's got it in them. So just just trust yourself. Really good advice. So, so that was kind of like your initial crafting your your sound. How how does that translate? Like, what's your? I mean, I know this, but for the people out there, you know, what's your live setup like? Is it a lot of things going on? Is it pretty straightforward? Like, what is your go to kind of live rig? My my life is in in general is keep it simple, stupid for me. <laughs> it it is that I like simpl- simplicity. <clears throat> I have my hard key amps. Uh, I have my Sans amp. I have my Signature for I have to say this is a shameless, shameless plug right Go here. for it. My, my signature EMG pickups that I'm in love with because we, we got the right combination of, of output that we wanted. And if, if anybody out there, and thank you for saying you like my sound, if you like my sound, check out my pickups and just check them out. You don't have to buy them, just check them out. I want you to be happy for a little while. But um, I think it's, it's, it's exactly what I was looking for. So there's not a, there's not a lot of craziness going on. I just want. I want to plug in and play. That's what, I don't want to go too crazy with pedals and stuff. I want to plug in and play and make everything easy. That yeah, totally makes sense in this way. You can concentrate on on the performance and the energy and stuff like that. Right. Exactly. Um, I can't imagine. I mean, you guys must be dying to get back out and play in front of an audience. Uh, Dude, I'm in my basement. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I love, I mean, th this is my jam thing. My, the highlight of my day is, is standing up with my bass. I mean, I usually sit down here. The highlight of my day is actually making a move and standing up my bass and making believe I know what I'm doing again, you know? And, and I'll tell you, man, just doing that, I'm, just to getting that plain shape is a different game. I have a, I have a show in a couple of weeks in Wisconsin. First Anthrax show back. And there's a, there's a workout regimen I usually have. Uh, but the gyms just opened. I'm not quite sure I trust the gyms, right? Mm. Just yet. Um, because the last time I, went, I tried to go to my gym, it was way too crowded for my liking. And people were not, you know, people were all over the place. Put it that way. Gotcha. And so therefore... I've been doing my home workout, my yoga and all that stuff. I bought an exercise bike. That's nothing That's nothing compared to the stage workout you kind of need, you know? So um, I'm, adrenaline is going to carry me that, that for, for that first show. And uh, afterwards, I'm sure that, you know, I'll have to ask some chiropractor to come and uh, put me back together again, you know? But I'm looking forward to it. I was going to say, it'll be, it'll be totally worth it, man, just the, Dude, being back on stage, you know, whatever you no need doubt. after that. <laughs> I'm so psyched right now to just, just that first step on stage – just to say, all right, we're back. Every, for everybody, not only the band, but for everybody. Music, live music. Uh, we were talking the other day, and um, I, I went to see the Foo Fighters last Friday uh, at Madison Square Garden. Now, this is my first show back uh, out of anything, right? I was a little weary about the whole thing, you know, or, you know, and, you know, but whatever. I just wanted to see a show. So I went, and it was a... Dude, I'm telling you, they blew me away. I, I'm, a, I'm a Foo Fighters fan anyway. But Dave Grohl and those guys, man, they put on a three-hour show. It was never boring. And it felt like the energy in that place couldn't be touched. It was unbelievable. Like, everybody wanted this. So I think that that leads to a great thing for all of us going forward. Yeah. All bands, all, all music lovers, there's a vibe in the air that the hunger, when this thing opens up, which is going to sooner than later... Um, it's it's going to be pretty awesome. So, I, for look, good times ahead. That's my line. Good times ahead. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think everybody is. I mean, you were telling me the other day that MSG just had a vibe uh, in it that you hadn't experienced for a long time. Uh, th you know, that being said, actually, it leads me uh, very, <laughs> very smoothly into a user question from Samuel. What is your sure. favorite venue in New York City to play at? You know, Anthrax, Eric, and you know this, and a lot of people know this. We've been very, very lucky. A New York band uh, coming up, uh, playing a lot of from Lemoore's in Brooklyn, which was my first show, which is my and still on YouTube, which is insane. Um, and you can see the, the very short haired Guido looking Frank Bello for his, I think, 18 years old, getting on my that was my first stage, uh, first time live with Anthrax. It's all on, it's all documented. I can't, even when I see that, I know I kind of have, I went, I went back and since I wrote the book, I remember that where the first song was Death Rider and I started headbanging and I hurt my neck in the first song. Uh, and let me, tell you, let me tell you something, dude. I thought I, I thought I really hurt something because it was like a burning, a bad burning. And all I could say is, just get through it. I'll go to the hospital right after. I'll just go, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, I didn't know what the hell I did. I thought I cracked my neck. About three songs in, second song was just terrible because there was pain. The third song, it started, it started coming back. And I got, maybe it just got a numb. It got numb and swelled up. But it was all swelled up after the show. But um, from Lemoore's, getting back to where we were. So Lemoore's was great. Great beginning. We've gotten so many places in, in Manhattan. Then we, one of the, the best, one of the best, we got to headline Madison Square Garden with the Clash of the Titans, which was very, very, for us, insane. Who ever thought yeah. the guys that grew up the way we grew up, we're all from New York, headlining the garden, insane. But then there's just a better one after that. You, this doesn't even make sense to me still when I think <laughs> about it. The Big Four played Yankee Stadium. Oh, yeah. Now, you have to understand, I'm um, a, a Bronx guy. I grew up in the Bronx 10 minutes from the stadium, being a diehard Yankee fan all of my life. Uh, for me to play Yankee Stadium, which it wasn't even a thought. How, do you, how many bands play New, Yankee Stadium to begin with, right? And then a band, a New York band, getting to play Yankee Stadium with uh, there's a couple of us in the band. We're, we're just diehard Yankee fans. That was that was the cherry on top of everything. We've been very fortunate that and it was and I say this all in the book again. Um, my grandmother, who, who pretty much raised me in the Bronx, um, that was her last show. She got to see because she gave Charlie and I the go, the go to say yeah, go do this. 
and the freedom to do this, that was the ultimate. Just seeing her after the show, and, and we, all, we both said thank you to her um, because she made it all possible. You know, she said, be free to what you want to do and uh, follow your dream. And she let us follow our dream, along with my mom. You know, all, all great stuff, man. Our families, our families was, was awesome throughout this whole ride. So, yeah. So I have to say with, um, with a big heart, Yankee Stadium. I uh, I remember that show and that that there was nothing quite at, the atmosphere was just I haven't experienced it you know before that or since then and and it's kind of a fitting uh, tribute to everything with your family that you just mentioned which I, I didn't even know at the time obviously but you know just knowing that now and a band from New York like you said with your family and everything I, I mean you can't make that up that so it, it makes no. perfect <laughs> sense that that's your uh, that's your favorite venue I don't think that was the answer people were expecting but it's a, it's a great answer. Well, you know what, dude, and I, as we speak right now, I still can't believe it in my, because we're going back and when you write a book, you go, it's a scrapbook of your life, right? And you're looking back and I know that was what, 11 years ago? Yeah. Oh uh, big God. four Yankee was Stadium. And, and that felt like yesterday, but I completely, because I'm onto the next page now and that's what happens in life. You put this away and you go on to your next page. And I still can't believe we actually did that. And, uh, uh, not a lot of bands could say that, you know, that we played Yankee Stadium as a New York band growing up 10 minutes from that stadium. I, you know, you know, I've been there a lot, not the newest stadium, but the older stadium. I was, I was I lived there for a while. I was every day. Me and my friends went every other day. It's awesome. Let me shut off my dehumidifier. Hold on, because it's loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And hey, guys out there, thank you for sending in the questions. We'll have some time for some more questions. So we'll try to get to all of them. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in while we wait for... Uh for Frank to come back here but yeah if you have questions just pop them in the comments they'll they'll get to me here and we'll do our very best to get to all of them uh, if we can so thanks again for that and there he is you're back I'm back <laughs> obviously I'm in my basement my, de my dehumidifier was going off <laughs> <laughs> it's all good these things happen this is yes. uh hopefully you know next time we do something like this we'll be in the same room how and, great uh, would that be to actually be human and and uh, within 20 feet of each other and actually like we used to do Eric we've been around a few years you and I so uh hung out many a time so um yeah I, I look forward to that yeah me too I mean I think the uh you know like you said it all before just the, it, there's going to be I feel like an explosion uh you know just live shows musicians it's everybody's aching for it and, and I think it's coming soon and uh I know all of us here at Zoom, you know, most of us are musicians, filmmakers, you know, there's audio engineers here. Everybody's just, you can tell, you can feel it in the air. You know, once this stuff pops off, it's going to be, I don't know what's going to happen. I think it's going to be something it. we haven't seen before. Dude, we, we need it. Like the Roaring Twenties, you know, think about it. The Roaring Twenties, like people are just celebrating. So the way I look at it, it could be that old. I hope it's like that. I, I hope people celebrate life because everybody's been, everybody's been through a tough time here. Everybody. I mean, uh, I have a couple of my neighbors. My neighbor was in rest. God bless him, man. He he had COVID across the street. My my friend Tony is a construction dude, burly dude. Um, he had COVID. He got it in January. He came home from work one day, couldn't breathe. Put went to the hospital. They put him right in into <laughs> ICU, dude. Tubes right away. He was in a, and he went right into a coma for four months, five months. He just came home a couple of weeks ago. Wow. And you know what? He survived. So uh, it's 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 real and it's it's terrible. But um, it's nice to hear a good story once in a while, right? Yeah, that for people sure. Survive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think and like you said, I think it's gonna be like a celebration with the live music and stuff. Is there is there any? I know you know we spoke about you still got to see the Foo Fighters, but are there any bands right now, new up and coming bands that you're excited about and, and are looking forward to seeing live? <clears throat> yeah, well, this is band my friends in um, this band called Crowbot. Have you heard them? No, I have not. Well, check them out. I wrote I wrote a song with them called Mountain. You could check it out. It's on iTunes and all that okay. stuff. Um, uh, they have a new. I'm, I'm selfishly promoting their EP, but it's uh, they have a new uh, a new EP out that I'm pretty excited about. I think it's they're they're an up and coming band. The singer's got a killer voice, killer voice, just good rock and good good rhythmic rock and roll that kind of stuff. So if you guys are looking for something new, just check that out. Um, you know, for, for me, man, I just can't wait. But I want to discover new bands. I want to go out and see a live band and discover as we used to, right? Right. How about just going in and just, wow, who's this band? Don't you want to do that? Wow, who's this band? And that yeah. discovery thing? Oh, sure, yeah. 
I mean, I, I remember mean, I think every, everybody's looking forward to that. That that's got to happen soon, right? Yeah, and that that's the best way to do it. I mean, I remember going to shows and asking who was playing after I paid to get in. You know, I remember those days uh, just because it was something to do. And I think we're going to get back to that now. And um, I agree. It's going to be a lot of a lot of cool new music out there. Um, yes. Yeah. What you know, so because people are definitely wondering this because you're you. What you know, what kind of what modern metal or modern thrash bands have really just blown you away in recent years? Well, Lamb of God, I love their last record. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's weird. It's it's so strange because you're friends with everybody, so you just I want to see everybody do well. You know, I'm I'm looking forward to I just texting my friend Michael from Volbeat, the singer uh, from Volbeat. Uh, I, I want to hear their, their new stuff I like so far. I heard two songs. I want to hear their new stuff. There's just different. I want to hear just what came out of this, right? Don't you just want to hear, because there's so much angst in everybody. I think that leads to great heavy music, right? So I'm so looking forward to every, just letting, letting the sponge that is our brains absorb all this stuff. I think it's going to be a great time for all of us because it's going to be so much rich, rich music. Um, look, I've been writing, I've been writing solo stuff uh, for, for stuff along with the book that I'm probably, I'm going to come out with around the book. And that's just solo stuff uh, because a few years back I did a, a, an album with um, Dave Ellison, Altitudes and Attitude. We did a, a side project. And a lot of people like that. So I wrote a lot of the songs in that record. So I'm bringing some, some of that vibe to like some solo stuff I want to put out that has to do with um, a lot of the things in this book. So, uh, I'm interested just just to get get more music out there. I can't wait for the new Anthrax stuff we're writing. I can't wait because that's that's going to be pretty nuts. Uh, pretty uh, heavy is isn't the word right there. I'm just I'm excited because I'm a fan of it also. So I, I'm I'm looking forward to just getting in the studio and and just banging them out, man. It's going to be a good run. That's awesome. I mean, I, you know, one thing that strikes me with you. I mean, obviously we know each other for a while now, but. Mm -hmm. The positivity that you're carrying through all of this, um, I think, is is exactly what everybody needs. And if you're if you're a creative and and you go through something like we just went through, it could be your best friend or your worst enemy. You know what I mean? Right. Like depending on how you handle it. So I'm really excited. You guys are getting back in the studio. You have plans to play live. I mean, I it's just hopefully that's in, indicative of of the whole scene. Um, but it's it really comforts me and everybody here to know that you guys are to, are doing all that, and you're doing it with a smile. You're excited about it. I mean, we can't wait for yeah, that because I know because look, everybody's been through a really tough time. I'm saying the world has not just it's not singular people. It's just everybody has in general. We've all had some kind of loss and just pain and it's just it's a terrible situation. But look, I've lived in that dark side for a while. You know what I mean? As we all have. We've all, you know my. After all these years, the one thing I've learned is what's the point of the negativity and, and just to think negative. For, uh, it, there's, no, there's no payoff. For me, I found that. And look, I was, look, I was pretty upset and pretty negative for a while, too. And I didn't know how to get out of it. But after, you know, therapy, meditation, blah, 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 whatever you want, to, whatever gets you there, you have this much, the way I look at it, you have this much time in this life. I don't want to waste it being negative. There's no time for that. I mean, what is that going to do? I if I'm negative, it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel good. Number one, I don't want to feel like shit. I don't, I want to feel good. So, uh, when, I'm, when you stay positive and, and hopeful, my main thing is hopeful, dude. Cause you, you really have to stay hopeful. I've learned that through the stuff I've been through in my life. You have to think and, and really hope that there's a better day ahead. And, you know, I believe if you give it that positive energy, it, it sort of comes true. You, you, you push it forward. You know, and let's, let's do this, man. I want to get that positivity. And then when it starts feeding, it, it's, you want more. Uh, yeah. The negativity doesn't do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm just tired of negativity, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't blame you, man. I think a lot of people forget that being a musician, being a band, a lot of it, a lot of it revolves around relationships. You know, relationships with band members, managers, record labels, studio engineers, you name it, venue promoters. It's it's very relationship focused. And if you yeah. if you can't keep your head and be like you're saying, you know, no time for negativity, you're gonna have a hard time kind of excelling in that environment. So, it, you know, it's good advice to everybody, and hopefully, people that maybe somebody out there needed to hear that, and and you just kind of pushed do. them. So, I mean. <clears throat> It's you know, it's all good, you know what I mean? Yeah, for me, Eric, with that, with that is, look, I'm not I'm not telling people how to live their life. I'm just telling you how I live my life, you know. And all I can do is I've been through this certain amount of years. I'm 55 now, right? The way I look at it, if I can 
look, I have a 15 year old son. I want to make him have a positive, healthy, happy life. Look, I want people in general, because I know how fast life is. Why not just live it and go for it and, and just be in positive and in a positive way. And that's you get more. You get more out of it when it's when it's like that, you know. It's the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, one of the things we do here at Zoom, you know, you know how we how we do things, but we, we try to you know, start relationships with, with creators of all different types. And rather than kind of here's some gear, talk to you never kind of a thing, you know, and, and we are, we are often inspired by our creators for not only new products, but just learning about thinking about things in different ways and, and kind of watching them grow and helping each other grow. So I think, you know, this has been a year where we've reflected on that and, and we've done a couple of these live streams. We did with Jordan, um, uh, bunch of other people from you know podcasters musicians and it's that's kind of the the common thread i'm seeing is is if anything people have shook off the the negativity that they may have had even lingering and it's like all steam ahead trying to grow past this and do something bigger and better in the future right and maybe we realize eric maybe we realize what we really have and we really and take a step back and say wow we're we had it pretty good. Everybody, I'm just saying, because it could all be taken away from us like that. And that's the way I look at it. I said, wait, okay, this is a great lesson. Look, but now can we move on and all that stuff? And I have to say another note um, with, as far as being a – I'm honored to be a Zoom creator. I lo- and I, you know me, dude. I'm not a kiss-up. I'm friends with a lot of the guys there, and they, they're all great people. But I, I, I consider it an honor to, to be a Zoom creator because it's, it's a great company. And that's why we're doing this right now. For, for me, I, I wanted to go with the companies that I believe in, that believe in me. And those relationships you just talked about, you have a relationship that you could just talk one-on-one and get it and be on the same wavelength. And it's, it's, not, it's not corporate. It, I, like Zoom doesn't feel like a corporate thing to me. It's my, my friends hanging out with some cool ideas. And shouldn't that be it that in the creative atmosphere? Shouldn't that be it? That's, that's what I feel. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well, first of all, I appreciate that. you know, I, you know, Truth. I've been with the brand for a very long time and I couldn't be you know prouder of, of the brand. Um, you know, it just, it was different, you know, I, especially when you guys were first starting out, you know, I remember, you know, going to magazines to find out what my favorite musicians were playing. And then I just thought automatically, well, that's what I got to buy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that kind of thing is, has dissolved over the years as people, you know, people really want to see what they can do uh, with something that they're not necessarily interested in who's using what on what stage as much as they used to be. You know what I mean? So, you know, the approach of like, you know, you want to see yourself in something and what, what can this product or, or service even allow me to do and allow me to achieve? You know, I think, you know, we kind of pivot, you know, and that's why our slogan is we're for creators. You know, we're trying to give people the tools to achieve whatever their create, you know, creativity takes them. Yeah. And, and it's way different than when early eighties, nineties, the way things totally. were. And, you know, I think it's a positive change. And, you know, with the internet, some would say it's the worst thing that's ever happened to us or the best thing that's ever happened to us as a, as a, you know, population on the world. But, right. you know, people, have the ability to you know you have access to a lot more creative people that otherwise would have been suppressed in years past you know you could record a whole album in your basement put it on spotify the same day you know right when i was coming up i had a four track cassette recorder and hope that the guy opened it at the label you know what i mean like yeah and didn't go right in the garbage right sure i'm sure most of them did all but one anyway but um yeah it's a completely different world out there so i think um you know we hit a good point you hit a good point there. See, you're, you're putting out this stuff, this technology. You can take it and use it for what pe- other people do. Like, say, I, I developed something with you guys. Take what we made and use something from that product and make your own out of it. That's the whole key. Make cr- something creative out of your own. Yeah, we can be the, the stepping board for it, right? But then take that. Take that product and create your own sound and your own vibe that comes from your head and your ears. That's what the, that's what the secret is right there. You could, yeah, you could say, all right, cool. I did something. I made something with you guys, and it, it worked. And how about taking this and you add to it when you when you get this product and really build and have your own vibe on it. That's where that's where the secret sauce is. Yeah, obviously we agree, and uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. And um, you know yeah. we appreciate you being a part of this 
you know, family. It's a family to us. It's and, a family. Um, it's awesome. <clears throat> you know, we appreciate that. So we're gonna we're gonna take. Uh, well, actually, we're gonna do a quick little lightning round of questions, and then uh, yeah, I'm ready from uh, from viewers, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up with you letting us know what's what's next for you. So, um, yeah. okay. So user questions from James. What are a few of the best concerts you've ever been to? I said that weird. Concerts you've ever been concerts. to. Concerts. <laughs> Kiss 77, like uh, 76. Oh, there's 77, 76. But I have to go straight with Kiss 76, Coliseum, Nassau Coliseum. Awesome, right? Um, 77, Madison Square Garden, the winter, December. Awesome. Um, Cheap Trick, any show you go to Cheap Trick, and I, I invite anybody to go to see Cheap, a Cheap Trick show. They're one of the best bands. They're the modern day Beatles for me. Uh, go see them. Always great. Um, it, this. Uh, I mean, Metallica, I, I've, I've toured with Metallica a lot over the years. Uh, I, I missed them with Cliff, too. I've seen them with Cliff, and that was, that was an awesome thing. Um, it, it's, there's so many in my head. Um, UFO, I don't know if you know this band, UFO. If you, don't, if, you have, if you don't know UFO, please look it up. It was a great, great band back in, back in the day in the 80s. They're still around, by the way. Uh, but one of my favorite bands, underrated. Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, you know, Black Sabbath. Rush, for God's sake, don't forget Rush. Don't forget Rush because we all love Rush, but the technical stuff that goes on with those with those instruments, really, and God rest Neil Peart's soul. Um, he's lost now, but not forgotten, that's for sure. But these are all the stuff that I, I, I plead with people to listen to. Just give it a listen, just one time, and just get that in you so you can write the next great song. Well said. So, okay, so this is from uh, Patrick. What other bassists from bands today have caught your attention? Uh, I still love Flea. I love what he does. Um, he's just incredible. Well, you know, Norwood from, um, um, what the hell's the name of the band? I was just talking about them yesterday. Um, I'll think, I'll get back to you with that. <laughs> um, I think Jason Newstead was a good, good bass, a great bass player um, with Metallica. Rob is an incredible, Rob Triello. Um, can you pronounce it? Trio from Metallica, one of the better bass players, underrated. If you, you ever see Rob's um, slapping ability and the funk stuff he does, he's incredible. See, I'm a bass fan, so I, I, even though I'm friends with all these guys, I think it's so much fun as a fan to watch these guys play. Uh, it's just, it just makes me, you know, just makes me want, want to do better. You know, it makes me want to rise, raise my game. So. Uh, yeah, there's so many great bass players all around, man. Awesome. So, Frank, we're we're kind of getting to the end here. So, mm. I want to give you a few minutes. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks uh, for having me. I want to give you a few minutes to let everybody know what you got going on, what's next, um, whether it's live show, record release, your book. You know, this is your your moment to let everybody know uh, what you have cooking. July fifteenth, um, Anthrax live stream. Uh, if, if you're an Anthrax fan, if you've never heard of us, give this a shot because it's uh, it's our history. I mean, I, I had to learn, relearn a lot of songs for this thing. Um, so July 15th, it's the 40th anniversary of Anthrax. We're celebrating with a live stream, which is really, really special to us and, uh, and our fans. So uh, I, I highly recommend seeing that because I'm interested I, as, a, <laughs> as a fan because I want to see that thing. Uh, I have this book, Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, coming out. It's October 12th. Available now at, on Amazon and Rare Bird Lit, rarebirdlit.com. You can get a signed copy right now in pre-order. That's available. Uh, I'm very psyched about that. When I'm, what we're talking about doing is some um, spoken word kind of vibe, uh, maybe an event kind of thing for the book uh, book tour, like a, a little book, bit of a book tour. Um, jamming some st- some songs from it and um, and having some fun and uh, Q and A, all that good stuff. So that. That's that's coming up. We're developing that now. Um, Anthrax is writing a record. I'm very very psyched about. Uh, I know the energy that we have. I know the intensity and uh, the rage that's inside of our gut right now. So I look forward to that being a really uh, a powerful record. I'm 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 not worried about that being that being uh, uh, anything but but heavy. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And look, I'm a, I'm a family guy as you are. You know I. The whole thing is it's nice to be home with the family for a long time, but I cannot wait to step on the stage. Next month, we start in Wisconsin. We have, we have a lot of shows in uh, festivals this year, but uh, next year is full-on touring, touring, touring world. So that's what's going on. It's a full plate, but I wouldn't have it any other way. 
That's great, man. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person again soon, hopefully, and and the band, the rest of the guys, and live music and all that. So once again, Frank Bell, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Frank, for joining us. uh, This great, Eric. And uh, thank you again, and yeah, hopefully we'll talk soon, man. All right, man. You take care. All right, you too. Peace. Bye.